Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. How does the soul work? <laughs> and so I would like to <laughs> speak about this probably in a different context than the audience <laughs> intended to hear, you know? <clears throat> that means how does the soul work? We may think of it from a mechanical angle, like how does a mechanism work? Or we may think, what kind of work does it do? Like if the soul had work to do, you know, what kind of work would it be? <laughs> so in other words, both contexts I will attempt to kind of respond to. But there was a motivation, initial motivation, before I <clears throat> even titled the talk. The motiv motivation was that pretty much we are eyes open in a moment that can feel separate from the world or it can feel inseparable. If your moment of being is inseparable with all phenomenology, your mind exists experientially to you first. <clears throat> then existence existentially exists, you know? So based on the association uh, with the phenomena, the work can be said to be done. That means imagine, <clears throat> you know, uh, you're a scientist, you need to look at a telescope to be certain of something, and so your work begins when the telescope is there for example. And for many human beings, it's, it seems like we are a potential of being that is in the human form. And people have looked at this world and they've seen it as a mere object. That's it. It's just stuff in a room. But those who wondered about the position of the mind, the uh, unknown aspects of intelligence, it was as if what is keeping, what is moving the stuff in the room? And that question is more closer to what I mean by how does the soul work? Now, the idea of the soul is very interesting. I think most people have a Casper kind of movie show version of it where it's like this kind of like invisible, uh, ethereal version of the body just flying out. <laughs> there was a scene and, and it was like the most spiritual Simpsons episode I had seen, you know, <laughs> where Homer was in, a, was in the hospital and he suddenly notices he's out of his body, <laughs> like above him looking at it and he gets scared and he comes back into his body, you know. And it's strange, you know, because we are embodied, but we speak about local attention within and without the body. That means your attention has a sort of expressive <coughs> outcome in the outer realms, but it has a certain expressive outcome in the inner realms as well. People don't notice it because you're, most people look for something to see. They don't realize the whole point of the inner realms is it's all about the seer. It's all about the one looking, not what's being looked at. So I would say, how does the soul work? The soul, it was derived from the word breath. In certain cultures, the word breath and soul, they have the same root. And so why was it the suggestion, you know, I mean, <clears throat> one practical way, common sense way you can think about it is that people would see people die back in the day, and before they had a sophisticated awareness of the uh, different biological systems of the body, it was as if, like, when the person stopped be breathing, something left. Something left. It was literally like when the person stopped being animate, it was as if there was, suddenly it was like an empty room, an abandoned house, you know?
the swell, the so, <laughs> the soul. I was about to say the swell, <laughs> the so, the soul. is attention's origin to itself. It is energy being conscious of itself. Now, if this energy that is conscious of itself appears to itself more in an individual manner, right now, I'll give you an example myself. My attention right now is in the moment. It is technically the whole moment, like this sphere, this sphere of awareness. Imagine around the your body, you know, like your, imagine your head is like the candle flame of a candle, okay? And your biological body is the candle wax. Now your your mind, your intelligence, your awareness in the moment uh, is the light, is the light of the candle, right? Now, right now, we are in a situation where back in the day, they didn't doubt the soul. <laughs> they didn't doubt the soul. They were doubting wh 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 where the soul was, maybe, do you know? <clears throat> but now we have forgotten the archaic multidimensionality that our ancestors managed to endure through this life so far. When you look at the human being, you're not looking at a perfect AI machine. You're looking at a creature that processes a certain range of information, makes decisions based on these informations, and has also the option of wondering who is making the decision. We can shift the context of the definitions, linguistic definitions of existence, and when it does, your mind can move in new ways archetypally. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that the soul is aware that there is thought. It is not thought. <clears throat> you know, it's not even the body as well. The candle flame needs the body. Think about it. The candle flame, it needs the wax. What's that thing called? The flick or something? Like it needs, <clears throat> it needs, uh, The candle needs the stability of the biological body. The candle flame needs the stability of the biological body. The biological body has no purpose until the candle is lit. And pretty much this is the difference between existing and living here. If the candle of your mind is lit, if you have seen something in this world that has roared at you that there is more than objects and subjects being watched till they are broken. The effort of the human being is to build is to design. I will tell you, fear not that you are a creation of uh, a creator. Fear that you were the creator and you did not create. Do not fear that you were the creation and did not create. Fear that if you were, if there is 0, 0.0, whoever you are, what religious angle you have, the whole notion is that God is you, not you are God. So what does that mean? That means in, in the mystical context, uh, and guys, please keep in mind, I'm speaking to a more mystically, philosophically oriented audience. What I'm trying to say is that I have tried speaking about this unspeakable witnessing phenomena every day. <laughs> And I can tell you, no words are enough. It can't be. <clears throat> the moment is too big. What does that mean? That means this is what has happened. Imagine the candle metaphor. Imagine a body has led to the projection of a mind, but the projection of that mind, that candle flame, has lit a new dimension. That means survival of the fittest, uh, I feel, is not the main reason we're evolving. It's not survival of the fittest, it's surviving enough to share what is fit. What fits the moment. This life moves in so many ways that really to be a true philosopher means that everything can move in another way. That's what it really means. 
you know, because it's all, it's all about an implication of how attention is classifying the experience of existence. You see, we say we're existing and we also say we're experiencing. So which one is it? You know, <clears throat> and philosophers have debated that there is no difference. There is a difference. You know, uh, some philosophers, I am personally am more on the Rene Descartes side. I, I feel there's a mind-body dualism. The reason being that the mind, the inner realms, are not limited to the outer realms. They are limited to the outer realms in their expression in the outer realms. That means, imagine you have a dimension of body and a dimension of mind. We don't know about anything else, let's say. So you have this unknown mind and this known body. And if your whole life you have been living in accordance to a known body, when you get a glimpse that there is an unknown mind, it means that how you have valued existence in a known way is prone to unknown change. And so when you realize the unknown is waiting in every tomorrow, <clears throat> your past becomes at best a giggle. It becomes a laugh. Those people who laugh at their past, they're the only ones who can see the future. Those people who are crying at their past, they will never see the future. They can't. You know, your attention is the most important thing, more than money. And everything, I mean, think about it. You even look at, in sociology, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there was first the physiological needs. You were pretty much satisfying, you know, a hunger, food, shelter, temperature, basic, you know, <clears throat> uh, tasks of nature throughout the day. You know, so that's the physiological level. Once you have maintained that, you go to the psychological level where then you begin becoming a character in a story that was more than just the generation of your own mind. You see, that is what, that's the feeling a lot of children have, where they feel they are in the party, but they are not a part of it. You know, that's one of the most cruelest things that this prototype of Civilization 1.0 has done. It has made this, the human being feel a stranger among humanity. Because it's honestly like a tag team kind of game. It's like the past generations tagged us, now we're it. We're the generation in motion. We build something, then we tag the next generation and we close our eyes as if we <clears throat> were always somewhere else or never here. The world has uh, boxed itself. It has boxed itself in words or in subjects that can never actually be the object. You know? That means the next time a person, let's say, says something to you, before taking what they say seriously, wonder how much do they see you. That means if somebody comes, let's say there's person A in a park and person B uh, comes to person A in the park and says some messed up stuff to person A, you know, <clears throat> and person A is there. Now, person A could literally descend into animalhood and, you know, put the person in their place, you know, or the person can just look at person A, can look at person B and just laugh and be like person B has no idea what they're saying because how can they know the eyes that only you have? You see, it's the honor of your own vision, you know, but it's not the enforcement of the inner realms. What does that mean? In the inner realms, you can act like a god. Most people do. In the outer realms, <laughs> in the outer realms, there is... No need to be a god because the whole point of it is an opportunity for duality to take uh, place, you know? <clears throat> it is now time for the human species to make galactic history. Technically, it means that we drop this nationalism act, do you know? And realize we're just creatures on this rock in the middle of nowhere. Because patriotism from a materialistic plas uh, uh, standpoint, uh, it, it's like honoring an uh, illusion. 
Do you know? And let me tell you what the issue is. The issue is not that what we have is wrong now. It's not that nationalism is wrong now. Nationalism was so important to even the stabilization of a single language. Before nations uh, had, had, had become nations to themselves, you could say it, would, it was like people were speaking different languages. Nationalism really led to one, uh, we're speaking different dialects, you know. So uh, once nationalism came place, pretty much language is stabilized. Now what I'm saying is the issue is we have colored the face of the earth and we're fighting over it in our minds. Let me tell you, when we, if we truly had realized we're temporary, it doesn't make sense to break things in this world. Because nature does it on its own. Every person you have ever seen in this world will break one day. Do you know? I, there was a time I remember when I was younger, certain <clears throat> I would get into fights, like physical fights. <laughs> uh, there was a time I, uh, I attended school in Iran for like a few years, but it wasn't Iranian. It was like an international school in Iran, an English-speaking school in Iran, Swiss-based. And... <clears throat> You want to first break things because there is a notice of injustice. I can tell you thinking someone has done something wrong can make you a tyrant instantly. Do you know, we can even say that when you look at the most craziest people, uh, like for example, the uh, certain dictators in history who led to the massacre of millions of people, do you know, it's as if they felt somehow justified. Do you see? That means Hitler was using this messed up propaganda of we are the one true race. Do you know, <laughs> what, a, do you know what I mean? It was literally like, like, I could tell you there was an, there was an arrogance that when you brand something as bad, people stop thinking, is it really bad or good? Do you know that's the issue? We believe too soon what we can actually never believe. Because if you were to believe what the world is every day is the world is changing. Technically the beliefs have to change every day. But we're acting like we're in the same world. Yay. You know? <laughs> I'm telling you, I have never been able to see one face to this world. It's impossible. Both your face changes and everybody else's. I remember I looked at pictures of myself when I was really young and I noticed that there was there was this strange kind of like <laughs> I don't know it's kind of like the obliviousness of those who their happiness is not conditional That means if you are a human being and you don't need a reason to be happy you are a very rare human being. Because we are finding reasons for everything. But you got you to gotta notice it, that some of the most beautiful moments in life, if reason it should be in the driver's seat and what should be in, uh, excuse me, reason should be in the passenger seat and what should be in the driver's seat is the simplicity of a natural being. That means sometimes it's a cool feeling. I don't think I have karma. I feel there is no karma and I just go into the moment and I watch. I watch the moment like a film. Right now as I'm speaking to you, I am watching the moment like a film. But also a part of this film is also in the inner realms. <clears throat> that means once attention is no longer, the language has stopped enslaving attention, your attention is free. And when your attention is free, you are no longer incapable, you are in capability. You are inside a capable movement.
you know, we all get tired. And when we do, we realize the value of a simple, gentle, efficient world. You know, we have been animals for such a long time that for any human being who has a mind that is conscious with this, uh, with the capable, with the position of human intelligence, if you behave like the animals in the jungle, you don't deserve to be in the concrete jungle. <clears throat> you know, back in the day, there was a sense of banishment. People were banished from kingdoms, you know. And the reason they were banished is because they could not see where they were. I would say that is the most important thing, that all of knowledge is to see where we are and what is happening. You know, I, don't, I can't see another reason to know. Why do people want to know things? Like, that's a good question, no? Why do, why do we want to know what's going on here? Why not just be like that squirrel on the branch or that bird in, in the sky who doesn't care about the politics of man's mind? What it is, is we should treat human activity as nature's most advanced game so far. That's why I say we are advanced communicators. Creatures that have emerged from the void now questioning the meaning of the systems of design that they journey to. <clears throat> the Japanese have an incredible saying. They say, the man is the room he enters. The man is the room he's in. And let us, instead of seeing it as a physical room, let us see this thing that we're calling mind. You know, we're all treating ourselves as if we have minds, you know. So, as minds, what is the purpose of matter? It could be anything. But as matter, what is the purpose of mind? It's limited to matter. I think just like levels to a city, imagine we had this giant sky city, and in this giant sky city, I wouldn't even say sky city. Imagine we had a building. Imagine we build a, br a bridge from Mars to Earth. Or I think it's much easier we invest in teleportation technology. You know? <laughs> All right, 
now to march into the unavoidable. How does the soul work? The soul uh, is not a concept, so the idea of work cannot be similar to how we perceive work, firstly. In this lifetime, the way I've noticed there to be some sort of additional layer of intelligence, or as Terence McKenna says, another tenant in the room, <clears throat> in regards to what could there be surpassing the mind that seems to be holding the alphabet of image and language, is that if the temporary individual is bound to be movement and noise that means if people are feeling that when a human when a creature makes sound and moves it is an individual object only unless that layout is pushed aside similar to frank uh, jackson's a knowledge argument for Qualia, unless Mary steps out of that black and white room and sees the new colors of the world, she will feel that all the universe is black and white. And it can be said that we feel reality is in a certain way until we realize it can be in other ways. So what does that mean? That means nobody knows actually enough to declare uh, uh, the issue is even if I even if an individual has so many insights, let's say nonlinear insights in re in relation to the mainstream's status in regards to the status quo ideas, I'm saying the world of an individual for the soul is inseparable. What does that mean? That means your soul is your whole moment. That is it. It's your whole moment. Everything else, mind, body, classification, classification, like, like literally a light entering a hall of mirrors, ching, 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 ching hitting all the mirrors and kind of going into different, uh, uh, you know, elevations. What we have seen, this is the biggest testament to nature's mind, is that nature has authorized individual control. The poet Rumi says, silence is the language of God, all else is poor translation. <clears throat> As if the mind has no ability to perceive all of its ability, if it chooses to remain the same archetype. <clears throat> You know, if there was an imagine alien invasion, imagine in the future we have an alien invasion, and these aliens are telepathically trying to invade us, what would our species do? First of all, not only we would need to, uh, to urge <clears throat> every member of the species to have an incredible accurate attention to what their mind is, the phenomenology, that means every person has to have a, such a clarity of noticing a single change of thought in the room. In their, in their inner realm. That means when you walk, walk while seeing your whole world. <clears throat> and if you want to see the whole world, even I could tell you, a person can even see behind them. What you don't see with the eyes, the other senses and the periphery vision recreate what's there. That means we think life, all those people are like, I gotta see it to believe it. That's one of your senses. There's four more. Nobody says I got to hear it to believe it. Nobody says I got to taste it to believe it. Nobody says I got to <laughs> touch it to believe it, you know? We say we got to see it to believe it, but what is seeing? It's like, is that enough? A light beam hitting an object and entering our eyes and yeah, that's truth, all right. You know, is, is that enough? We have to 
have a bravery, a fearlessness that is for the sake of our grandkids thousands of years from now. There's been certain moments in my life where I could say they were dangerous moments, kind of emergencies. <clears throat> and in those emergencies, I can tell you there was an additional force aside from the intuition to the degree that I have even thought intuition is a higher dimensional device attached to the person or following the person. I feel what is intuition is how in the in the future the collective species uh, uh, AI has become our intuition pretty much our intuition is an advanced computer from the future but what we are is not per se a simulation life may seem simulated because it's temporary but what is here is not a belief or a disbelief. It is raw experience. Raw experience, you know? <clears throat> Just like how <clears throat> Chef Ramsay would see like one of those people and be like, this fish is raw. <laughs> it's like us realizing, oh my God, the direct experience of the moment is raw. <laughs> Honestly, the way Chef Ramsay in, in those kitchen shows would say raw was like, ah, oh, but he was like, raw. <laughs> we are We are a known microcosmic alphabet <clears throat> that can generate endless unknown words of worlds. If there was an alien invasion, the most important, crucial thing would be attention, studying the nature of the mind, no longer thinking it's just one side of the coin, material or immaterial, that game's gone and boring. Now it's as if all dimensions that are accessible must be administered. The sensory perception is a gift. Now, what opens this gift is the story the person has accepted so far of themselves. <clears throat> right now, we're just uh, finding ourselves comfortable with associating as one self in one world. Now, Recently, in scientific findings, we have the ideas of parallel universes and whatnot. But in ancient times, they believed the reality was multidimensional. That means there is a reason man has the concept of God. There is a reason man is believing or disbelieving God. Because if, it was, if the gods were here, there would be no reason to believe or disbelieve. It's like, it's like you think about, do you need to believe, like, let's say... Uh, um, you've gone to a coffee shop to, uh, you know, get a coffee and you're speaking to the cashier. Do you need to believe that the cashier is there? It's like you don't need to, or do you need to disbelieve the cashier is there? No. You see, you don't need to believe or disbelieve because it's instant. It's engageable. The moment is engageable. The moment the person can put an effort as an individual archetype and it has consequences. <clears throat> I would say instead of interpreting karma, we should interpret how the echo of our uh, I would say I would say it like this. For me karma is like based on the vehicle. 
What does that mean? That means if there's a drunk driver and you get in that car, that's karma. Literally. All cars that there's drunk drivers in them, they, it's those, uh, you know, those are uh, karmas in motion. <clears throat> because 8 billion people can be on a ship, but we need one fool to just make one hole and the whole ship goes down. So noticing karma is noticing how you're playing chess as a known phenomenology within an unknown phenomenology, pretty much. So guys, we're going to go into a soul quote tunnel today. A quote tunnel is a segment of the show where I read pretty much <clears throat> uh, uh, a list of quotes from either a theme or a certain person. So in the quotes I'm going to read, guys, I want you to pay attention to how many different people on this planet have perceived the notion of soul and in what ways they have perceived them, perceived the idea. Ferdinand Falk, F-O-C-A-H. The most powerful weapon on earth is the human soul on fire. Dorothy Day. Food for the body is not enough. There must be food for the soul. Edna St. Vincent Millay. The soul can split the sky in two and let the face of God shine through. C.S. Lewis, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. John Steinbeck, a sad soul can kill quicker than a germ. Okay. Frederick de, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the human body is the best picture of the human soul. Chugging warm coffee like it's a glass of water. <laughs> All right, guys, let's let's continue with the quote tunnel. Frederick Douglass, the soul that is within me, no man can degrade. Henry David Thoreau, with all your signs, can you tell how it is and whence it is that light comes into the soul? Carry you you limits. Soul shadows you everywhere. Wow, what a quote. That's a quote where I don't think I can see the full dimension of it in this talk. Soul shadows you everywhere. Ralph Waldo Emerson. One thing in the world of value is the active soul. Cicero. Diseases of the soul are more dangerous and more numerous than those of the body. 
He means confusions of the mind, I find. Josiah Gilbert Holland, the soul like the body lives by what it feeds on. Carolyn Miss, the soul always knows what to do to heal itself. The challenge is to silence the mind. Dame Rebecca West, it is the soul's duty to be loyal to its own desires. It must abandon itself to its master passion. Daniel Defoe, the soul is placed in the body like a rough diamond and must be polished or the luster of it will never appear. Ed, Edwin Leibfried, the soul can hear the violets grow, it can hear the throbbing heart of God. Emily Bronte, whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. Okay. Fyodor Dostoevsky, the soul is healed by being with children. James Joyce, when the soul of a man is born in this country, there are nets flown at it to hold it back from flight. Guys, that thing Fyodor Dostoevsky is saying the soul is healed by being with children, what that means is like everybody's been a child, right? And when you're a child, life is simpler, do you know? And so this is what sometimes I feel all those human beings who end up becoming parents or <clears throat> let's say um, house husbands or housewives. <laughs> so the whole point of it is that it's like you're attending to the simplicity. The more uh, easier, not easier, the more efficient you are in your youth, the, the easier it is for you to challenge doubting your own efficiency. <clears throat> now, there is this thing also that if you're super inefficient when you're young, that means you don't know what to do here on this planet and you're super inefficient. What tends to happen is a moment of transforming rage. That means if you're someone who you feel in society or in certain atmospheres, there's a sort of, um, here's the thing, any moment that you don't feel like you are being you, it's in that moment where you are, you will not get to see your karma. And what I'm trying to say is like, that's the wisdom of youth that stay natural. That's the wisdom of uh, uh, old age, re endure regardless of the unnaturalness, regardless of how much chaos you see, stabilize the order. Pretty much what it is, is I really don't care about the chaos and order to some degree because they're endless. For eons, chaos and order has been fighting. So many sages have opened their eyes trying to uh, find a way out of this suffering to try to make the chaos and order of the world stop. But the chaos and the order of the world, they are endlessly they are endlessly at war. So what tends to happen is you get to see inside the order there is a little bit of chaos. Inside the chaos there is a little bit of order. That means we have made the mistake in our morality by not ushering ourselves into a yin-yang civilization. I honestly feel we need to have two types of civilizations here. Do you know? But <clears throat> they could be one civilization like a cake divided in half. We need to pretty much create a left hemisphere to the brain of civilization, to the mind of our civilization, the collective ethos, and a right hemisphere. You know, what, what it is, is we don't want the theist and atheist to stop debating. You know, but we also want the, the content to change. That means when we truly realize we are minds, there comes this 
uh, vitality to use it. Imagine right now in your hand there was an advanced alien technology. Would you care to use it? Imagine Thor gave you his hammer and you were worthy. And you held Thor's hammer. You're like, holy shit, dude, I'm holding this. And Thor's like, yeah, man, the gods think you're worthy. <laughs> <clears throat> and suddenly you realize it was Loki and the hammer was fake. Uh, fake, you know? <laughs> you're like, get out of here, Loki. <laughs> Loki being Loki, you know? <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is like if, if you treat the moment as an advanced technology, if you treat your whole moment as your mystery school, you will become a student of every karmic event. <clears throat> so I would tell you, I don't know how people have a time to learn from outside teachers when your karma is in every moment teaching you, you know. And the thing about karma is once you step out of that vehicle, Imagine there's a drunk driver and you're in that vehicle and suddenly the driver's like, yo, man, I got this. And you, in that moment, you get out of the vehicle or if you're smart and brave, you get the key out of the car quicker than the drunk person can sit in the car and drive. You just go and take the key and you don't let them drive. Very simple. Because let me tell you, with enough patience, an other strategy can come up. You know, a lot of drunk driving is, I think, because there isn't a patience to find another method. <clears throat> or the person doesn't know what to do with the car or something, you know. Really, we have to just be more advanced. And I have no idea how it's going to happen uh, on, on a collective level, aside from just maxing out natural effort in the uh, naturalness of the system's commands. You see, imagine that your enemy is not people or an object or a subject. Imagine your enemy is your mind, yourself. You see this in some, in some shows, <clears throat> in certain narratives, where the character reaches the final boss, but the final boss is not a, a super powerful evil person. The final boss is the most evil version of that self that has defeated all the bosses up to that point. So the last boss to defeat in this video game of life is the chaos of the self. As Carl Jung declared, you must confront your shadow. You must stare at your shadow and you must see how bad you can be in this world. And you must stare at it until you realize you can be more than that. And that's when you find new shoes for a new life. James Joy says, when the soul of a man is born in this country, there are nets flown at it to hold it back from flight. Emily Dickinson says the soul should always stand ajar, ready to welcome the ecstatic experience. William Blake says the soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. Marcus Tullius Cicero, just as the soul fills the body, so God fills the world. Just as the soul bears the body, so God endures the world. Just as the soul sees but is not seen, so God sees, but is not seen. Just as the soul feeds the body, so God gives food to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the mind of the universal sector. Let us welcome ourselves to our true nature and build the most advanced civilization fathomable, and then see what happens. You know, my father, uh, he's like, when I think about, my father is an incredibly wise person. And his presence really is like, his knowing feels like a tower. To me, when I was a kid, when I would see my father, his, his intuition see, appeared to me as a tower, this giant tower, you know. And I remember I, all, I had this very complex view of my dad's uh, sophistication in, in, re, in, in regards to metaphysics. Uh, but one day I remember I had a dream that I died. And I wanted to know how my dad would, uh, based on his insight, perceive that moment of 
death. And so what I did is I went, and it was kind of like I felt like I can't just go ask my dad, you know, what is, what do you think your uh, view on death, your last breath would be? So I went to my father and told him I dreamed that I died and I told him my view of death that it's just this hovering attention. I don't know what to do. You know, if it happens, it's just the sight, right? And I asked my father, what would you do if you were in, in that, like that moment? So I managed to ask the question. You know, I just changed the, con I made the context more pleasant to ask the question. And I remember my father gave the most profoundest answer that literally it was like my father gave me a diamond uh, and it, it, it took me years to notice it, you know. And my father told me, I'll do the best I can. You do the best to your ability. And that's it. And I realized my father had raised me and my brother by in every moment accepting himself and doing the best he could. And the simplicity of that algorithm to this whole system where there is endless ways it can mean something, endless ways it can be meaningless. It's literally this, that we are an energetic phenomenon. That's the thing about passion. It can, it can uh, move beyond human archetype. Intensity is, is not per se just left to the human idea. What does that mean? That means somebody could see the mo a blacksmith's son could see, like hear the a legend of Thor, and in that moment where he was making the swords for like the kingdom to defend itself against this war, this kid just visual closed his eyes and felt as if if he was Thor and he had Thor's hammer, what would it be? So it's as if like that kid was building all these souls as if uh, all these swords as if he was a. Uh, a Thor in his mind. Do you see? So in the inner realms, you're not limited to the human framework. But when it comes to dialogue, discussion, individual living in the linguistic simulation of societies, uh, uh, of the social program, cultural program, and even civilization is a program. We are all writing it in accordance to how we behave here. You know? <clears throat> that means an advanced civilization will not, most likely will not see any... any no, no, it, like we will no longer see good and bad people. Everything will become a unique artistic dimension of its own, but how aware that dimension is to the collective is what can be, I don't want to say penalized. The idea of penalty is uh, uh, should only be kept in soccer. <laughs> Not that we shouldn't have moral systems and law. Law is crucial. Law is like a part of the advanced technology. It's like an advanced way we're using language. <clears throat> but it's just that when we ask ourselves, why are 8 billion creatures working here? Like, who are 8 billion human beings working for? And let's forget, uh, let's act as if we don't know the answer, not that we already know the answer. If we already know the answer, there's no reason to ask the question. We ask the question because we don't know the answer. I would say... We have been under the impression that we have to find meaning, but consciousness actually allows us to generate meaning. So it's like wondering what is the purpose of a cup, then you pour iced tea in it and you drink it. That's the purpose of the cup, there you go. That cup uh, completed its life purpose. Then it comes back to its neutrality of design, then the mind can evoke it again with another purpose. Do you know how many different days a person opens their eyes on this planet not being having the same sense of past? Every day I wake up, it's not that my ideas on the future change, it's that my ideas on what, how long or how my past was changes. I've had days where I've woken up and I felt life is too short. I've, woke, I've, I've had days where I've woken up and I felt life is too long. Seriously, I've woken up and I'm like, this is too long, you know? 
at the same time, at the day, the next day, suddenly life is too short. And I realize it's all how energy is containing itself through a language of its own acceptance. It is the era of the pure soul. The non-ideological entity which is entitled to the cosmic activity inseparably. Reasoning is limited. You know, for me, this is what I noticed that secular society, the scientific effort is trying to inspire the children of the future generations by suggesting that we want to build an incredibly uh, rational civilization. But let me tell you, it's impossible because we are emotional. By the mere positioning of an emotion, a person can get upset and leave a room. That means you can irrationally change the course of something you have built rationally for a long time. You know, for example, all those people who go through divorces in their life. There is a sort of rationality, but the emotions allow it for the irrational outcomes. And if, if, a, if human beings realize every person, it's natural. Every person has a reception threshold and expression threshold. The person needs to feel like they received a certain amount throughout the day. They also need to feel like they've expressed a certain amount. Now, if you're a person who, let's say you're flying solo, let's say you're a yogi in a cave, right? Your behavior and communication is not going to be like the same way as it is. Like, that means if the person was stuck in a castaway island situation, Technically, that's how it feels when we're on this planet. We're on some island in the galaxy. And the smartest thing we can do is send signals, send message to accelerate the communication of the species so the glow of what's going on as a real activity on this planet accelerates. <clears throat> you know, this may sound like a strange idea, but I thought if the idea of a black hole was a portal, this might not make sense, but it may be necessary that we send a nuclear bomb into a black hole. If the black hole is like literally a portal where potentially there is another reality behind it, if there is another reality behind that door, we may not see it, but the explosion will make enough of a Cat, like a castaway uh, signal, SOS signal, of our species in the void of space. So what it is, is to <clears throat> just knock on the door of higher dimensions to see if there's anything there. Of course, this is an incredibly, uh, entertain this idea playfully, guys, it just occurred to me, but... It's just too much. Literally, you wake up in the morning at a certain energetic level. You can choose to stabilize a certain reality. I, I, I identify a certain boundary to what is real for you. But as you get tired, it changes. What it is, is that rather than us thinking we are our personalities only, uh, we are just our bi biological, physical embodiment, We should perhaps think that we are invisible traveling points of sight that through different bodies communicate. You see, technically, when you speak to someone, if the attention and the, the concept changes, right? It's like there's a dynamism to the conversation of two different inner realms, two different worlds trying to speak. As they speak, they, they see... Uh, the, 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 a sort of third reality emerges. This is why when I speak to different people, I tell them, treat when I speak to you as if it's, it's a certain room. Because you cannot speak to a person and they're not being an uh, input of vision.
the work of the soul is actually for the mind and body to be so at balance You pretty much study your outer realms, you reach a sort of contentment and sincere realism with it. Then you notice your inner realms, usually through stillness, silence, inaction, and trying to wonder how an effortless nature works, you know. And then after you notice the inner realms and outer realms, you come to a sort of uh, ultimatum of preferencelessness. That means that's the thing, that the soul is the watcher of all that is working in the moment. It is intelligence. And intelligence as a pillar of civilization must be defended and added to. I remember I was in Milan. I was there only for two days. I, I was in Milan in a coffee shop. And uh, I, was, uh, I was having a cappuccio, and I remember I bought a notebook from a store and a pen. I do this. Wherever I travel, I go and buy a notebook and a pen, you know. And <clears throat> I remember I, write, I, I started writing this essay on how every philosopher is sculpting. Every human being is sculpting the story of what it means to be a human being in accordance to how far the influence of their inner realms echoes into the outer realm, outer realms and how, far, how, how well the person notices their work. That means you can say somebody stressed or depressed is caring more for the image of themselves that is inefficient and weak more than an image of themselves that is efficient and weak. I mean, think about it. If the mind, just consider this, if the mind has an ability to see, create a, a visual, a sort of inner uh, landscape of like suffering the mind what is what is making the mind incapable of having the other ability it's like you know you're using your hand to pick up one object what's making you to, to pick up one so your mind is grasping one sub subject why is it why do you why does the person feel they can't just let go and grasp another subject it, i think really a good a good training thing is a person to Imagine an advanced civilization that we never need to hear sirens again. It's too advanced for that. You see, it's skill. Skill is the savior. If everybody focuses on skill and everybody focuses on uh, creativity, which is in another way of saying you need the space before you can express the skill.
the person asks themselves, who am I? They see the who, the am, the I are all a moment of attention. I can say, because I know myself, I can never know myself. A. D. Gordon, the soul of the slave, the soul of the in quotations little man is as dear to me as the soul of the great. Plato says the soul of man is immortal and imperishable. Yo, Plato's saying this so casually. Somebody's like, hey, Plato, my soul's suffering. And Plato's like, buddy, the soul of man is immortal and imperishable. You know, get out of here. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad, the greatest of wealth is the richness of the soul. And I would say that is alignment with the truth of nature, with the intelligent truth of nature, the, with the intelligent truth of your universal sector. You know what it is? It's like human beings fighting over language is literally like two trees fighting over the color of their leaves, like cutting each other uh, down because of their color of their leaves being different. And the leaves change by the seasons. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the soul that sees beauty may sometimes walk alone. And I'll tell Wolfgang von Goethe something, the soul is alone, the soul has to be alone because that is the only way you can be all so the concept of being alone and being with others that's in the human framework anything that surpasses that is more like an energetic relationship so if you have an experiential energetic intuitive relationship with the world that is far superior to any conceptual analysis if you have a living relationship with the life of your universal sector, with the nature of your universal sector, that is the grandest teacher. Charles Bukowski, if you're losing your soul and you know it, then you've still got a soul left to lose. Genius. Charles Bukowski, guys, is an um, <clears throat> incredible writer for uh, like if in 2011, before that, Charles Bukowski was like, I was trying to like be a writer like him. <clears throat> I like this show called Californication and the main character of that was based on uh, Charles Bukowski. But anyways, guys, to continue. King Solomon, your own soul is nour nourished when you are kind. It is destroyed when you are cruel. Aristotle, the soul never thinks without a picture. That's why we need pictures before we can ex uh, define a thought that is a part of that picture, part of that landscape of perception. The soul is like the center of the circle. The mind is like all the different degrees that you can perceive, you can be the soul. And the body, the mind is the radius. And the body is the circumference. 
the soul cannot have a second. The soul can't have a body. Do you understand this? This is such a crucial idea, which is the, where the preference list of people changes in frequency. Think as if every human being, the way they receive an idea sets their eyes. When you notice your inner realms is like glasses that change. Imagine you had like endless glasses, sunglasses, and endlessly you were just changing these sunglasses, you know. So thoughts that come and go are like that. If a person can notice a thought, then you actually hover in the state of pure physical instinctual alertness. Your reflexes heighten because the body is not afraid of its own animalhood. This doesn't mean it becomes an animal. I'm saying, you. here's the thing. Those who demonstrate power, skill and uh, discipline is another context, but those who demonstrate power, they are very weak. They feel weak. That means if you're in a room and you, you want to show someone or there's a character, let's say there's P, person A, B, C, D in a room. And let's say person D wants to show or person, let's say person B is showing off to everybody. Do you know? It's like in that moment, there is as if the person was not satisfied with how things were being, so they had to demonstrate a position. Now, when I say life is a chess game, because I was privileged to <clears throat> have this door-to-door, um, -door, uh, I worked for this charity for a while. And this charity was, uh, I could tell you, it was door-to-door -door donation. So you don't know how many doors I have knocked on, but it wasn't like for gas or anything, it wasn't like, it was pretty much just knocking on a door and telling them about a charity and uh, being honest. And if they want, if they cared, they cared. If they didn't, they didn't, you know? But there's something about com communicating often when you communicate a lot where you begin to see how many people are actually looking at what's really happening in the moment and how many people are just uh, responding to a sort of they're trying to here's the thing if you're trying to see uh, a masterpiece your master is in pieces what I mean by that is that it's like the best way to go in an art gallery is, is, is it's like a dream you just woke up in the art gallery when I wake up in the morning, I actually want to see the world do something unknown, not something known. I'm endlessly scanning my realm for the new. And it really happens when you actually see there is uh, the, the incredible intelligent presence of a geometric dimension within all phenomena. That means I wouldn't be surprised if we were perceived from another dimension or some subtler view, let's say, from ex with, uh, by uh, extraterrestrial eyes, we would probably appear to them as ge geometry. So right now as I'm speaking, imagine there's a way of looking at this moment where all the sounds I'm saying are have geometrical shapes to them expressing. You think a snowflake has geometry in it, but the language of man doesn't? Materialism is accepting geometry uh, of in the middle of nowhere, is it not? All of knowledge is branding an object with a subjective uh, uh, static solidity, uh, with a subjective a a symbol. It's like, how can you name a changing system? You see, so it, it, once we realize we're beyond language, then the soul has no container, so it is an expression of its ability. Aristotle, and I read that, last quote, Langston Hughes, when people care for you and cry for you, they can straighten out your soul.
the soul is silence, the mind is noise, the body is movement, and the world is void. How does the soul work? We can say, what is the motivation? Or as the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm going to bring in this metaphor of how in the Bhagavad Gita they perceive that like the body, mind, soul archetype model, it was as if the, uh, the soul was inside a hidden chariot. And this hidden chariot, uh, the chariot driver was the mind. And the chariot driver, in some sense, uh, was navigating the horses, which was the body. So the work of the soul is actually to have the cha trust the chariot driver and the body. That's, a, that's really all you can do as a soul, trust, you know. But really, <laughs> when it comes to your mind and body, your mind and body are more like you are a, a chariot driver. What does that mean? That means when you trust the intelligence of the universe, you experience what appears to be the collective body rhythmically. Renounce who you have been if you want to see who you can be. Just drop what you feel you never deserved. If there is a part of the being that they feel that they can engage the efficient instantly, that means be uh, literally be like a swordsman that has learned from a cobra in regards to attacking. What does that mean? That means instant. Instantly you see efficiency like whack-a-mole, you know, as if Thor was playing whack-a-mole and it was just like instantly you see, you see the moment engage. Efficiency is, I could tell you, there's something about truth that if it wasn't here, we'd have nothing to talk about. <laughs> The most blessing, one of the greatest blessings is that this universe is not a picture on a wall. It's changing. The mystery is alive where a civilization is built on a giant turtle's back. And that giant turtle will one day be our collective mind. The future generations will never walk alone even though we do now. I would like to read some quotes before I end off, actually, from Attar. Attar of Neshapur, he says, let, lo let love lead your soul. Make it a place to retire to, a kind of monastery cave, a retreat for the deepest core of your being. Farid al-Din Attar says if the eye of the heart is open, in each atom there will be 100 secrets. Attar says the sea will be the sea, whatever the drops philosophy. Attar says the home we seek is an eternity. The truth we seek is like a shoreless sea of which your paradise is but a drop. No, this ocean can be yours. Why should you stop, beguiled by dreams of evanescent dew? The secrets of the sun are yours, but you content yourself with, the, with motes trapped in its beams. Turn to what truly lives, reject what seems. Which matters more, the body or the soul? Be whole, W-H-O-L-E, -E, be whole, <laughs> desire and journey to the whole. That means live for the greater picture, even if you have seen smaller pictures. Live for the greater picture, run towards it. Attar says, when first you enter wisdom see, be, beware, a wave of indecision floods you there. 
Attar says this was no friendship to forsake your friend, to promise your support and, and, and at the end abandon him. This was sheer treachery. Friend follows friend to hell and blasphemy. When sorrow comes, once true friends are found, in times of joy, ten thousand gather round. Attar says, and guys, we want to build an advanced civilization where hell was a choice, was an unnecessary choice. Attar says, the fruit of love's great tree is poverty. Whoever knows this knows humility. Attar says, the ocean can be you. I read this, okay. Attar says, a man whose lo eyes love opens risks his soul. His dancing breaks beyond the mind's control. Attar says, a thousand for his love expired each day. And those who saw his face in blank dismay would rave and grieve and mourn their lives away. To die for love of that bewitching sight was worth a hundred lives without his life. None could survive his absence patiently. None could endure this king's proximity. How strange it was that man could neither brook the presence nor the absence of his look. He's, uh, Attar is speaking about the beloved, the divine union. That means when you go look at all the mystery traditions, mis uh, uh, wisdom traditions, well, the whole point of it was uh, that you are an individual phenomenon lost in a world, you unify with the source of phenomenology. Once you unify with the source of phenomenology, you are rendered as the whole system's mind. That's what. That's also what Attar means in the previous quote, where he says, "A man's a man whose eyes love opens risks his soul. His dancing breaks beyond the mind's control." And last but not least, Attar says, were you indeed not blinded by the curse of self-exile that still grows worse and worse, yourselves would know that, though you, see him, you, though you see him not, he is with you this moment on the spot. He's talking about the true self. That means whatever is your truth, if you think about it, everything you've accessed in this moment has been in the moment momentary. Like it's as if life is like a time is like an arrow, and when how we experience time is like as dots creating this arrow, you know. So it's like moment to moment to moment to moment, you know. So so what it is is he says, Attar says, he is with you this moment on the spot. It means the universe is alive before you were. Now ask yourself, who is your true teacher? And you'll know the work of your soul. Is the glory of our cosmic event in attendance? Novelty is our next commander. For a civilization, for an advanced civilization, we require advanced communicators. For advanced communicators, we require an awareness and an advanced look at what communication is. If the person realizes that all communication is again inseparable from the whole cosmic event, there is always enough energy for the free will. If the free will, here's the thing, you don't have to trust your mind, but you have to respect it 24-7. And that respect means being in awe and fascinated by how intelligence is happening for you. That means the moment intelligence can't be compared, it becomes its own exploration. Everybody is technically an explorer. And I would say we were explorer of the outer realms. Now we have become the explorers of the inner realms, of the mind of man, of what is this thing called imagination? What is this thing called memory? What is this notion of future? How is space and time uh, correlating to everything, you know? As you free your attention 
from language, from objects and subjects, you will suddenly laugh and cry at the same time. Then the waters of the divine event settle and you're left in a world that there was nothing wrong with it from the beginning. Because then advanced civilization needs solid ground to be built upon, you know, a solid true core value that the human being deserves to see what its most advanced effort of its species is like. Everybody deserves this. This is the gift we should, everybody in, at Christmas should ask all the children of the future generation, Santa, give me an advanced civilization. Santa's like, holy shit. <laughs> Santa probably like just gives them a mirror because we are the ones that must build. Pretty much I think the best strategy is uh, not to have too many opinions on a moment that is changing, rather walking with your moment of life as if the moment you are eyes open from the day you're conscious in the conscious waking state and you're attending your own life, you know? And so your freedom is really how you have defined freedom or if you have realized your eyes uh, were smiling before language was frowning. So uh, yeah, thanks for listening guys. Much blessings, namaste. And just the point of that chariot metaphor, uh, the soul's trust in the mind leads into the mind's greatest commanding ability of the horses. That means the mind that knows the soul has trusted it becomes immortal, becomes like a, uh, a, 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 an avatar, an avatar of a true experiential nature that's instantaneously known. The eyes, be, the gods behind our eyes and the gods in front of our eyes have sandwiched the true God that stands in between. Your moment, your whole moment of being, regardless of what kind of motion of content and ideological relationship has occurred, is divinity breathing. Rise, mankind, rise.